Okay, so the topic of this video is classification and taxonomy. So let's get started. So when we talk about classification and taxon uh, taxonomy, we should really start with Carolus Linnaeus. And kind of what he's most famous for is creating the, the system called binomial nomenclature, the, sy the system of giving every organism two names. And I'm willing to bet you've heard examples of binomial nomenclature. For instance, you might know that humans have the scientific name of Homo sapiens. Two names, Homo and sapiens, that's an example of, the, of, uh, of binomial nomenclature. And so in, in this system of giving every organism two names, the first word is a, a broader word. And in general, the, this category is called the genus category, and it tends to be more broad. And the second word tends to be more specific. And the second word is called the species name. And so if we look at two examples really quick, Carolus Linnaeus representing humans on the left, and we have a model on the right uh, depicting um, Homo erectus. But you might know that the genus for both humans and Homo erectus is Homo. See what I mean by it's a broader category. It applies to more than just one organism, but the species name is unique to both of these. On the left, we have sap sapiens. On the right, we have erectus. So when we combine the two, the genus and the species of humans would be Homo sapiens. When we combine the two, the genus and the species, you have Homo erectus. And so this is the scientific name or the binomial name of humans, Homo sapiens, and then of Homo erectus. If we uh, look at some formatting really quick, you know, if you're typing the binomial name of an animal, well, here's a cow. The genus name of a cow is the word boss. Notice how it's uh, capitalized. And the species name of a cow is Taurus. Notice how it has been lowercase. And because you're typing it, it tends to be an italicized print. If handwritten, it's really no different other than uh, instead of italicizing the names, it's underlined. The genus boss is still capitalized. The species name Taurus is still lowercase. You know, here's another example, uh, a gray wolf. The, if typed, the gray wolf, the genus is Canis. And notice again how it's been capitalized. And the species name is Lupus. Notice how it is again in lowercase. And because this is typed, uh, it, it's in italicized print. But if handwritten, again, it's still Canis lupus. The genus is still capitalized, but if handwritten, the only difference is underlying the two words. Well, you know, you might be thinking, you know, what's the point? What's the point of giving every organism a binomial name? Can't I just call this thing a jellyfish? Well, you can, but the problem is in the name, in the title jellyfish, there's a couple things that are misleading. Number one, they're not fish. And number two, they're, they're not actually made out of jelly. So you see, when we use common names, it can be a little misleading. Another misleading common name would be a seahorse. You know, calling this thing a seahorse, you know, hopefully you recognize, well, it's, it's not a horse. These aren't mammals, like, horse, like horses that gallop on land. You know, seahorses are fish. You know, here's another example, uh, a starfish. Again, a starfish, just because it lives in, in the ocean and in the waters, that, that doesn't make it a fish. A starfish by no means are fish but their common name might imply that they are a fish. Uh, another good example would be a prairie dog. You know, a prairie dog, the name implies that it's in the dog family, when in, in, in actuality, prairie dogs are rodents, and they're more in common with mice and rats. So common names can be a little misleading. Well, here's another example of why, you know, common names can be a bit confusing. Well, here's a picture of a puma, here's a picture of a cougar, and Here's a picture of a mountain lion. If you're thinking, well, it's just the same picture, you're, you're right, it is. Because in some parts of the world, these cats are called pumas. In other parts of the world, these cats are called cougars. And in other parts of the world, these cats are called mountain lions. And so it makes you think that these are three different species, when in reality, they are the same species, puma can color. And so the genus again, is the name Puma, and the species name is Cone Color. And so that's kind of the, uh, the way that binomial names work. It, it removes some of this confusion. 
And so one of the problems that we, that we encountered in our early years of classifying life is, you know, with Linnaeus and some of the other scientists at their time, they didn't have some of the fancy tools that we have, you know, DNA analysis and such. And so they built their classification system based around physical features. And you can easily understand why, you know, sharks and dolphins at one time were thought to be very closely related uh, animals. They both live in the oceans, they have similar smooth streamlined body, fins and flippers, but upon, you know, closer analysis, you know, we can see that this, uh, this system led to many errors. But upon closer analysis, you know, we realize that sharks and dolphins are quite different to animals. I mean, sharks are members of the fish category and dolphins are mammals. You can, uh, you can easily imagine at one time, mushrooms were thought to be very closely related to plants because again, they grow out of the ground, they kind of look like plants. Uh, turns out, again, mushrooms and, and, and plants are actually very different from one another. And so but if, when we only use physical features, we kind of run into problems. So the uh, solution that has popped up in recent uh, decades has been using DNA to analyze and show relatedness. If we look at the DNA of the flower on the left with its A's, T's, C's, and G's, and the DNA of the fungus on the right with its A's, T's, C's, and G's, we notice a lot of differences. Well, this tells us that fungus and plants are very distantly related. They, they don't have much in common. Well, how can we tell of these three flowers? Which flower is more you know, closely related to the blue one in the middle? Well, if we examine the DNA of the three, if we examine the A's, T's, C's, and G's of the, of the blue flower in the middle and compare it to the one on the left, maybe there's only uh, one base pair that's different between them. But on the right, if we compare the one on the right to the middle, we might see more differences. Well, this is how we can use the DNA to analyze which of these flowers is most related. Based on this information, I could conclude that the two flower species on the left are most closely related to one another. And so as we move on into taxonomy, taxonomy is the science of classifying life according to shared characteristics. And what we're going to introduce, what I'm going to introduce you to are the levels of classification, the levels of taxonomy. Each individual level is called a taxon. You might know that they start off very broad. The taxon called domain is the broadest of the categories. And then every taxon underneath it becomes a little more specific, kingdom, and then phylum, and then class, and then order. And within an order could be many families, within a family could be many genus within a genus could be many species and so you see the levels become more and more specific as you go down now one thing you might have a hard time remembering is just kind of the order so sometimes it helps to make a little mnemonic memory trick and so maybe something like dear king philip came over for good spaghetti something silly make up your own of course but something silly just so you remember the order of these taxonomy levels and the point of this is to easily show relationships. And you'll see a good examples of that in just a moment. Well, let's look at an example of how we can use those taxonomy levels to show relationships. Let's look at the taxonomy levels of a leopard. You can see there's a bunch of organisms in this collage and a leopard being one of them. Well, if I were to say a leopard is in the broad category, the the domain called eukarya. Eukarya, eukaryotes, these are organisms whose cells have a, a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. Well, not everything in this collage is, a, uh, is in uh, domain eukarya. The bacteria that's flashing, they're not in the domain called eukarya. But everything else is in this domain called eukarya. So you can see what I mean by it's a very broad category but the next level down should be a little more specific. The next level down would be the kingdom called Animalia. Look at the collage. Not everything in this collage that's remaining is an animal. The tree and the mushroom are flashing because they are, they've been eliminated. They're not in the kingdom called Animalia. 
but all the other organisms that you see are. So even though Kingdom Animalia is a little more specific, it's still pretty broad, but the next level down should be even a little more specific. The next level down being the phylum called Chordata. These are animals with backbones. And so right now, the snail, the crab, and the insect are flashing because yes, these are animals, but they are not animals with backbones. So the next level down, phylum chordata, you can see is a little more specific, but it's still pretty broad. So the next level down should add even more clarity, more specificity. And so of the collage and the animals that are remaining, which of these are in the class called mammalia, the mammals? Well, the fish, the eagle, and the frog are flashing because they're not mammals. But all the organisms that are left are. So you can see every level down becomes a little more specific than the one before it. But still, the category of mammals is still pretty vague. There's a lot of mammals. So the next level down should add even a little more clarity. The order, leopards are in an order by the name of carnivora, the carnivores, the meat eaters. Well, that would eliminate the gorilla and the rabbit. But you can still see there's still a good number of meat-eating mammals. So even uh, the next level down should add even more clarity. Leopards are in a family by the name of the felidae, the feline family. Well, that would eliminate the bear and the wolf. Bears and wolves are not cats. And so in the felidae family, we have these three, the lion, the cougar, and the leopard. But even at this lower level, you can see it's still kind of kind of uh, broad. So the next level down, uh, leopards are in a genus by the name of Panthera. Well, that would eliminate the cougar. The cougar is in a different genus category. But the lion and the leopard are both in the genus called Panthera. So even at this very, very, very lower level here, well, second to the last level, you can see that it's still somewhat broad because it applies to more than one species. And finally, leopards are, the species name is Pardus, and so that would eliminate our lion. And so we finally have the taxonomy levels of a leopard here. Well, let me bring back these three animals, the rabbit, the lion, and the leopard, and kind of compare and contrast all three of them. I want to show you how these levels of organization, these taxons, can allow us to see relationships. Well, they're all in the same domain, the domain called eukarya. All of these have cells with a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. They're all also in the same kingdom, kingdom called animalia. Rabbits, lions, and leopards are all animals. They're all in the same phy uh, phylum called chordata. They're animals with backbones. So right now, their classific uh, classification levels are identical to one another. And even right, uh, the next level down, the fourth level, the class, the class called mammalia. Rabbits are mammals, lions are mammals, and leopards are mammals. So, so far, they're in the same classification levels. But now we're going to start to see some differences. The lion and the leopard are in the order called carnivora, but the rabbit is in the order called lagomorpha. I hope I pronounced that right. As we continue down, the Lion and the leopard are in the family called Felidae, as we saw a moment ago. But a rabbit is in the uh, family called Leporidae, which I always thought was kind of ironic because it looks like the word leopard. I'm sure it doesn't mean leopard in, in Greek or Latin. As we continue down, the lion and the leopard are in the genus called Panthera, and which is different than the genus of the rabbit. I'm not even going to try to pronounce some of these. And then lastly, the species name is where the lion and the leopard differ from one another. This, uh, the full species name of a leopard would be Panthera partis. The full species name of a lion would be Panthera leo. And the full species of the, of the rabbit would be the genus word and the species word together. And so when I look at this picture here, I can really see nicely that the lion and the leopard are most closely related because they have seven out of those eight levels in common. The rabbit and the leopard, or you could say the rabbit and the lion, have four out of the eight levels in common. So this is what I mean, uh, meant earlier when I said we can use classification levels to see relationships. 
And as I finish up this video here, I just kind of want to highlight uh, the domains and the kingdom levels, the taxon, dom uh, of the two taxons at the top, the domain and the kingdom levels. And so when it comes to the domain, there are three big, broad categories or domains. Uh, one of them is called the domain bacteria. And these are prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells lack a nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles. They have a chemical in their cell wall called peptidoglycan. And then there's the domain called the archaea. Like bacteria, archaea are also prokaryotic. They lack this peptidoglycan in their cell wall. And one of their more, I guess, well-known characteristics is their ability to survive in incredibly harsh locations. I'll mention a few in a moment. And then there's the domain, as we said earlier, the domain called eukarya. These are eukaryotic organisms. Their cells possess a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. Now, within these domains is the next level down, the next level down being the kingdoms. And currently, classification, um, most would kind of argue that there are six classification uh, kingdoms. However, th these, these kingdoms are fluid. Uh, they've, they've been updated over the years and will continue to be updated. Some will argue that the six kingdom classification system might be a little outdated, but right now I think most tend to recognize six kingdoms of life. And so within the domain bacteria is the kingdom called eubacteria. These are the common bacteria, the everyday bacteria that we encounter in our day-to-day -day life, the, the reason why we practice good hygiene, these are the bacteria such as E. coli that might live in our intestines and, and in, in some cases could get us sick. In the domain archaea, there's the kingdom called archaea. Not very original, I know. Uh, some people call this kingdom the archaebacteria. And I said they can live in extremely harsh environments such as really, really salty locations, much saltier than the oceans, really, really hot locations, and even anaerobic, no oxygen environments. And then within the domain Eukarya, there's actually four kingdoms. The kingdom called Protista. These are one, you know, tend to be single-celled organisms like amoebas and paramecia that swim around typically in, in watery locations. And then there are kind of the three big kingdoms that I think everybody recognizes. The fungus, the plants, and the animals. And if you're in my class, we're going to go into more details on these kingdoms another day. But I just wanted to introduce the three, uh, three domains and the six kingdoms. Okay, so as I wrap up this video, you know, if you're in my biology class, you know, pause the video and try to answer these questions. I'd be happy to check your answers before school or after school one day. Uh, thanks for watching.